Now that you have a better feel for the microbes in this module, it's time to take a look at some of the specific tests and characteristics for each. Trepanema is actually the first microbe we will cover, but not the last, to use a two-tiered testing method. We will have an interesting graphic to represent this for Lyme disease, which also uses two-tiered testing. The two tiers include a screening and a confirmatory test, which we'll also revisit in virology. For syphilis, the screening test consists of the VDRL and RPR testing. These assess the blood for antibodies to treponema and are cheap and quick to screen with. However, they can also have a fairly high false positive rate as other antibodies may cross-react with the reagents. This is why confirmatory with the more expensive tests are needed. Though dark field microscopy is easy and cheap, microbial samples can degrade quickly or become useless if the patient has taken antibiotics. It is also only useful in primary syphilis, which is usually treated for empirically. In developed nations, secondary and tertiary syphilis are rare. This doesn't seem to stop them from being a part of test questions frequently. The FTA antibody and MHA assay are used to confirm that the antibodies from the screening tests are the correct ones. For tertiary syphilis, neurosyphilis is the most concerning subclass. By taking a lumbar puncture of the cerebral spinal fluid, we may not see the microbe, but can run analysis for antibodies and white blood cell counts. That was a lot of testing, and based on tiers of screening and confirmation, as well as the severity of the disease. Let's recap some of the finer points. RPR and VDRL are only about 80% sensitive for primary syphilis, meaning that they can be false negatives nearly one out of five times. Even if positive, the rate of false positives is quite high, leading to a second tier of confirmatory testing. The sensitivities can increase with the progression of the disease somewhat. Depending on the clinical presentation, giving us the stage of syphilis, we have a few options to consider. If they have chancres, dark field microscopy can be considered. If hand and foot lesions from end arteritis, consider FTA and MHA testing. If neurologic symptoms or GUMAs, use the lumbar puncture. For Lyme disease, most diagnoses occur from clinical presentations and symptoms, such as a characteristic rash. However, if the rash doesn't occur, ELISA for screening and Western blot to confirm can be used to detect antibodies against Borrelia. The CDC has depicted the two-tier testing that we mentioned in syphilis. Though the tests are different with Borrelia, concept of screening and then confirmation testing is the same. Here, as we will see in other diseases, a Western blot is a confirmatory test. With tick-borne diseases, it is sometimes important to know what type of tick it is. Though clinically the tick has often detached by the time a patient presents with symptoms, you may sometimes be able to determine what type of tick it was. This greatly alters your pre-test probability of certain diseases. Academically, it is also important to know that the Ixodes tick may carry both Borrelia and Babesia, leading to a co-infection. Many insect vectors and fungal infections are geographically specific, so keep in mind the area the patient lives or just visited to on a trip. Now we can finish off this tier with a much simpler bug, Leptospira. Lepto can sometimes be cultured by simple blood culture or fluid from infected tissues. However, serology and PCR have become more versatile and more commonplace in past years. An interesting, but not really testable, characteristic is the biphasic nature of Leptospira. The first few days seem like a severe flu, which may present as sepsis. After about a week, when immune globulins are detected via serology, begins the immune phase, and other potential sequelae. In general, this microbe is pretty low yield. To continue on with our first case study, Mr. Druzen, as he came to the hospital with a fairly severe looking limb infection, it is proper to treat before lab test results come back. We would want broad gram-positive coverage, as well as coverage for MRSA. We may want to also consider gram-negative coverage for some of the less frequent, but still possible infectious agents. Did you get this far on your own? And if so, what antibiotics did you feel were the most appropriate? If we had to pick only one, such as on an exam, vancomycin would probably be a great choice. With inoculation by skin bacteria, MRSA is a common, immediately concerning, and potentially lethal infection. If you chose a broad-spectrum beta-lactam, that wouldn't be a bad secondary choice, especially if it had lactamase activity. It would also be a great idea to get imaging done. An x-ray may see if there's a foreign object, such as a broken needle tip lodged in the arm, or perhaps an ultrasound to see if there's an abscess that needs to be drained. Hopefully you also thought about infective endocarditis mentioned previously. 
We could use an echocardiogram to look for any growths on the heart valves that may indicate a vegetation. The choice of Vanco would be beneficial for this as well while we await for sensitivity results. Don't worry if a lot of this is unfamiliar currently. Hopefully these cases help to stimulate the entire process instead of looking at one fact or concern in isolation. Mr. Wiley returns two days later after a chest x-ray and some lab results. His complete blood count shows elevated white blood cells, an indication for a current infection. His chest x-ray also demonstrates an atypical consolidation pattern. This would be a bit tricky, as each of the atypicals must be tested for in unique ways instead of the general blood cultures used for typical infections. If we assume this is of bacterial origin, we may want to consider testing the patient's urine for Legionella antigen or nucleic acid testing for chlamydia or mycoplasma. These latter two will be covered in an upcoming module, so don't feel overwhelmed by options yet. Mr. Wiley mentions that he is uninsured and must pay cash, and wishes to only run one test for now. He figures he's been sick for a few weeks, so he can take it slow at this point. Which one should we choose to best diagnose the most likely pathogen? Well, if you caught the part about his history of recent travel, that should be a red flag. Hotels and motels are great keywords on an exam to lead you to think about air conditioning units. This makes Legionella a bit more likely than the others since we also have more diagnostic proof of a potential bacterial infection, and Mr. Wiley seems a bit frail in appearance, we could consider putting him on an empiric dose of antibiotics until the test results come back. If we decide to, and we're leaning towards Legionella, what would be our best option? Let's write him a script for a macrolide for now, which would also cover the other atypical bacteria pneumonias. We'll call him with the lab results in a few days to check in on him. Now, Ms. Hall, who left our office so abruptly the other day, has now returned. She claims that she started feeling better when she left the office and decided not to take the antibiotics, flushing them down the drain. Now she presents with newly forming skin lesions near her genitals. When asked, she states they do not hurt, and that she recently made a mistake by getting back with her ex-husband one night. It seems our initial thought of UTI is much less likely now. This is why comprehensive patient history can make all the difference in reaching the proper diagnosis. Had we inquired, perhaps STDs would have been higher on the list. Luckily for Miss Hall, this likely case of syphilis should be easy to treat. What tests can we run to confirm the diagnosis? And what antibiotics would be best? As this is most likely primary syphilis, we can use the RPR or VDRL test to screen and dark field microscopy to confirm. This microbe is still very sensitive to beta-lactam antibiotics and can be knocked out with regular old penicillin. Hopefully these cases have provided some insight into the clinical considerations every practicing physician must weigh. These are actually very straightforward and easy to manage cases. In real life, it's not always the case. Though we briefly discussed how primary treponema infections are usually sensitive to penicillins, this isn't always the case for other stages. In the next and last year for this module, we'll review the antibiotics to consider for each of these three genus in this module. If you appreciate the material we are creating, the best form of flattery is sharing it with your friends. If you haven't done so, please subscribe to our YouTube page, like us on Facebook, and bookmark our website as we continue to create and gather more resources for your use.